As Paul concluded his first letter to the Christians living in Corinth, in 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 13, he commanded them by saying, Watch ye, stand fast in the faith, quit you like men, and be strong, is how he ended that verse. As Paul concluded his letter to the Christians living in Ephesus, in Ephesians 6, 10 and 11, he commanded them by saying, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. Put on the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. He then went on to discuss in that chapter what the various pieces of the armor of God represent. And it is noteworthy that Paul said that Christians must put on the whole armor of God. And he provided the reason for why we must do so. The reason we must have every element of God's armor equipped and why we must keep it equipped is because only when it is equipped, only when we have it on us, uh, will we be able to stand against the persistent wiles, that is, the trickery of the devil. God's people are commanded to be spiritually strong. The Bible is very clear about that. Not only are we commanded to be spiritually strong ourselves, but the Bible, and what we're going to focus on in this lesson, the Bible teaches that we must strengthen others. We have a duty to strengthen others, especially our brethren. In Luke 22, verse 31 and 32, I think this is an interesting passage to go to, but in Luke 22, uh, two, verse 31 and 32, Jesus said this to Peter. He said, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan hath desired to have you, that he may sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for thee, that thy faith fail not. And when thou art converted, strengthen thy brethren. And so in the context of this chapter, it's a sad context, Jesus told Peter that he would soon deny his Lord. But after he repented of denying him, he was commanded to strengthen thy brethren. And I think this is a good question for us to consider. After Peter denied his Lord, did Peter eventually follow through? Did he repent and did he follow through with what Jesus commanded him? Yes, Peter did strengthen his brethren. Peter went on to become one of the greatest servants in the kingdom of God. Less than two months after his denial of his Lord, Jesus selected him to be the keynote speaker on the day of Pentecost. And that shows the grace of God. Uh, he, he was the keynote speaker on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2. We also, as you look at the book of Acts, he featured him as the key character of the first half of the book of Acts. He's a very prominent figure in the book of Acts. Uh, God, had used, God also used Peter to write two inspired books, First and Second Peter. And then we also le uh, read in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 1, that God placed him as an elder within the local congregation. Peter certainly was and still certainly is helpful in promoting the strength of Christians. And you can get, uh, gain strength from his writings as you read the Word of God. Again, this topic that I've been tasked with, it's kind of the inverse of Travis's lesson, but what I've been tasked with preaching on in this lesson is how to help Christians when they have asked for strength. And so more specifically, uh, to kind of zoom in on that topic a little more, when a Christian comes forward, perhaps when the invitation is offered uh, at the end of a lesson or uh, at the end of a sermon, and they ask for strength publicly uh, before the congregation, or perhaps they come to you uh, privately asking for strength. The question is, what can we do to help them? What can we do to help them? And this is a great topic of focus for our, or to focus our attention upon because this is a practical uh, topic. This is an important topic. If you've been in the Lord's Church very long, uh, or long enough, you have likely either witnessed a Christian coming forward publicly asking for strength, for prayers, or you have uh, experienced a brother or sister coming to you privately, maybe calling you on the phone asking for strength. And many times Christians respond to this request for strength by hugging that Christian, by compassionately speaking to that Christian, and by saying that they will pray for that Christian. And all of those things are great to do. Those are things we should be doing. But you know, sadly, sometimes the help stops right there. It doesn't continue on. Sometimes we do not provide them with the continued guidance and support that they need to get stronger. 
And that is really what this lesson is going to address. What can we do to provide our brethren with the continued uh, support, the continued guidance that they need to achieve that strengthening that they need? And so with that said, let us get into the main discussion of the lesson. There are three main sections if you're taking notes to this lesson. And in the first main section, I believe this is where we ought to start. And it's similar to some points brought out by uh, John and Travis in their lessons. But where we ought to start is that when Christians ask for strength, we must point them to the ultimate source of spiritual strength, which is to God and His Holy Word. That's where we need to point them to. You see, we all must understand that the spiritual strength of a Christian, or the lack thereof, is proportional to the relationship that they have with God and to His Word. Amen. It's proportional to that. And so, simply put, we cannot be spiritually strong if we are not right with God spiritually. And we cannot be right with God spiritually if we do not diligently read and study His Word if we don't love His Word, and if we don't faithfully obey His Word. When a Christian asks for strength, it's not necessarily an indication that they are not right with God, that they are not trusting in God, or that they're not reading, studying, or following uh, God's Word. Now that could be the case, but that's not always the case. However, regardless of where the Christian is at spiritually who asks for strength or makes this request, the solution is found in pointing them to the only one who can truly provide them that spiritual strength, which is God. And how does He do that? He provides that spiritual strength through the direction of His Holy Word. That's what makes the Bible so important in our lives. When strength is requested by a Christian, it would do them good, or do them much good, if we, as fellow Christians, encouraged them to take some time to study about the incredible strength of God and uh, to study about His wonderful character. And the more we understand about God's nature, the more we understand about His attributes, uh, especially His love for us and His great strength, the stronger that we will be uh, spiritually. Also, it would do them much good if we encourage them to take time to study and consider the incredible power of God's Word, which Paul called the sword of the Spirit. In Ephesians chapter 6, verse 17, it's a weapon, it's a powerful tool. And, that strength, and so we need to help them consider the strengthening impact that God's Word uh, can and will have when they read it, when they dig into it and they heed what it says. Now for the remainder of this first main section, I want us to consider some passages. I want to go through some passages that touch on these two truths. First, I want to look at some passages that talk about God being the source of our spiritual strength. And then second, I want to talk about how His Holy Word is the specific means by which we increase our spiritual strength. And so I'm going to now read some passages through with you uh, that discuss God as the source of our spiritual strength uh, and how He is a, a source of spiritual strength to His people. In the song of Moses, or in the song that Moses and the children of Israel sang unto the Lord at the beginning of Exodus chapter 15, verse 2, they sang, The Lord is my strength and song, and He is become my salvation. Many places in the book of Psalms exalt the strength of God, and I could give a lot more than I have in this lesson, but we'll look at a few. Psalm chapter 18, verses 1 and 2, it says, I will love Thee, O Lord, my strength. The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer, my God, my strength in whom I will trust, my buckler and the horn of my salvation and my high tower. Psalm uh, chapter 18, verse 32, later on in the chapter, it says, it is, it is God that girdeth me with strength and maketh my way perfect. As you move further along in the Psalms, if you get to Psalm chapter 73, verse 26, you find that it says, My flesh and my heart faileth, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. So these verses are all exalting the strength of God. Psalm 119, verse 28, it says, My soul melteth for heaviness, strengthen thou me according unto thy word. 
In Isaiah chapter 40, and I think John referenced this chapter, it exalts that, that chapter, Isaiah chapter 40, it exalts the strength of God. And we can read of the Lord in that chapter asking a question in verse 25. The Lord in verse 25 of that chapter says, To whom then will ye liken me, or shall I be equal? And the answer to that question is no one. No one is equal to Jehovah <coughs> as far as strength. And soon after that, in Isaiah chapter 40, verses 29 through 31, we can read this about God. It says, He giveth power to the faint, and to them that have no might, He increaseth strength. Even the youths shall faint and be weary, and the young men shall utterly fail or fall. But it says, But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. And uh, it says, They shall run and not be weary, and they shall walk and not faint. And so with all these verses that I've had us look at and that we've considered about God's strength, from them we can also see the benefits of relying upon His strength. Uh, if you go back to those verses, you see benefits with, uh, in relying upon His strength. And so some of those verses that we looked at, they show us or reveal to us that God's strength provides the faithful with confidence, with refuge, with defense, and with comfort. And I, I like all those things, to think about those things. And these truths about God's character, they're not just taught in the Old Testament either. When you go over to the New Testament, you find the same thing. The God of the Old Testament is the God of the New Testament as well. In 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 3-5, through 5, Paul, he talked about God, who he said is the God of all comfort. And because of the comfort that we have from God, we can comfort others who need that comfort too. In Philippians chapter 4, verse 13, Paul made this confident statement. He said, I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. And that's a very uh, great uh, verse. Many of us know that verse by heart. Uh, God is the one who provides us with our spiritual strength. And so we've, we've I think, nailed that point down. But now let us uh, consider some passages that show the specific means by which He strengthens us spiritually, and that is through His inspired Word. And so first off, Romans chapter 10, verse 17 is worthy of our consideration uh, with this point. That verse says, So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. Uh, biblical faith, it is produced by reading, studying, and hearing the perfect and understandable Word of God. That's how it is produced. It is something, it is not something that we randomly get zapped with as we're walking down the road. God doesn't zap us with faith. It takes our effort to increase our faith. And so we, we have to work towards strengthening our faith. And so since that verse I just read, Romans 10, 17, teaches what it teaches, since it says that faith cometh by hearing, uh, what does that tell us about the necessity of reading and studying His Word? It tells us that if we want to be spiritually strong, and if we want to please God, then we must diligently do those things. We need to study. We need to read. We need to meditate upon God's Word. Furthermore, the Bible reveals that we must have biblical faith to please God, as John alluded to in his le uh, lesson. That's Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6. And trust in God is required to have spiritual strength. And so we need to trust in God. 2 Timothy 2.15, it says to study, to show thyself uh, approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Uh, in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 15 through 17, the next chapter over, Paul said this about the Scriptures, talking about uh, how Im important they are, how needful they are in our lives. And he talks to Timothy, and he says, And that from a child thou hast known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. And then he said, All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. And so Paul, he said that the inspired word of God, it can make man spiritually complete. And this would include its sufficiency in strengthening us to the level we need to get to in order to make it through all of life's trials while remaining faithful to God. 
On a similar note, 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 3, it says, uh, According as His divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain to life and godliness, through the knowledge of Him that hath called us uh, to glory and virtue. And so in His Word, in the Bible, God has given mankind everything they need to know for how to live a godly life and how to make it to heaven when this life is over. And that's all we need. We, that's all we need in this life. And so that's what's sad when you have these man-made books that men have wrote over the years and try to elevate it uh, or try to put it up to the same level as God's Word. God has given us His Word and it's sufficient. At the beginning of 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 18, Peter, he commanded Christians to grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. The Bible, it provides us with the knowledge of God's will, and as we grow in our knowledge of His will, and as we conform our lives to His Word, we grow stronger spiritually. As he ended his message to the elders uh, of the church at Ephesus in Acts chapter 20, verse 32, Paul said this, and this is a, a comforting verse. He said, And now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you an inheritance among all them which are sanctified. You know, sometimes we can lose sight of these fundamental truths, and that's why we need to be reminded of them often because we are forgetful beings. We must continue to grow in our knowledge and in our understanding of who God is. And we must remember the incredible power that God's Word can and will have in all of our lives if we dig into it, if we meditate upon it, and if we follow it the best that we can. Moving on from there, in the second main section, I think this is also important for us to consider with this topic as we're focused on strength. And here's, here's, what we, here's the second uh, main section, is that we must have, personally, and we must help others to have a biblical view of the strength that God wants us to have. We must understand, first off, as, as we talk about this uh, point, we first need to understand that physical strength and spiritual strength are different. A physically weak person can be spiritually strong, and a physically strong person can be spiritually weak. And some of the, uh, some of the most uh, spiritually strong people that I know, and maybe that you know, are some of the most frail and physically weak people that we know. And that's not an insult to them. You know, many of such people who I'm referring to are aged Christians who've been in the church a long time. They've been fighting the good fight of faith for many years. And though they might barely be able to walk or barely be able to stand, their spiritual strength and their confidence are shown in living faithfully for God. Now, on the other hand, there are many people who are in excellent physical health today, but they're spiritually weak, and that's sad. And sadly, brethren, I think this is uh, carried over into the church. Some Christians in the, uh, are in this condition where they're physically in good shape but they're spiritually weak. And why is that the case? Oftentimes it's the case because they're so preoccupied with the physical, with this world, and with their bodies that's decaying. And so what that leads to is when they prioritize their physical health to the neglect of their spiritual health, it leads to them being spiritually malnourished and spiritually weak. In the Bible, it speaks about this distinction or this difference between physical and spiritual strength in many places. For example, in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 8, Paul, he said, For bodily exercise profiteth little, but godliness is profitable unto all things, having promise of the life that now is, and of that which is to come. And so in this verse, Paul, he contrasted the superior importance of godliness, which is a reference to uh, spiritual strength and spiritual well-being, he contrasted that with physical well-being. And this difference is important, uh, or this difference in importance is, very, is made very clear when all of us just take a moment to consider our physical bodies. Our physical bodies are all wearing out, and we all will eventually die, unless, of course, the Lord comes back first. But the reality is, is that the spiritual side of us, our soul, is going to go on into eternity. And it's going to remain in either heaven or hell endlessly. And so that's of far greater 
importance. In 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 8, don't misunderstand what Paul is saying. Paul did not discourage taking care of our physical health, but rather he emphasized that our spiritual well-being is of far more importance to take care of. In 3 John chapter, or 3 John verse 2, there's only one chapter in there, uh, John said this to Gaius as he, as he wrote to him. He said, Beloved, I wish above all things that thou mayest prosper and be in health, talking about physical health, even as thy soul prospereth. So he's talking about two different healths within that uh, verse. And so here in this verse, John, he expressed that he wanted Gaius to have great physical health. And that's something that is good for us to desire, to have great physical health. But he wanted him to have it along with great spiritual health. Again, taking care of our physical health or our spiritual health, it's more important in view of eternity. However, that's not to say that it's not important to take care of our physical health because it is important. And I want you to think for a moment about uh, what Jesus, as he was tempted, as we read in Matthew chapter 4, verses 3 and 4, how we can read of one of the temptations that Satan tempted Jesus with. Uh, you know, it says that he was hungry in that context. And Matthew chapter 4, verses 3 and 4, it says, And when the tempter came to him, he said, If thou be the Son of God, command that these stones be made bread. But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, physical food but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. And so in response to uh, the devil, he did not say, Jesus did not say that physical nourishment is not important, but rather he was emphasizing that spiritual nourishment is far more important. And that's the point that he was trying to make. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 16, Paul, he provided encouragement to faithful Christians by saying, For which cause we faint not, but though our outward man perish, Yet the inward man is renewed day by day. The Bible is, depicts uh, itself or the Word of God as a mirror for the soul. I, I think that's just a beautiful picture um, of what God's Word is. It's a mirror for the soul. And when we look into the perfect law of liberty, James 1.25, we look into that mirror. And if, if we honestly look into it and examine ourselves honestly... Uh, whether we're living according to God's Word, whether we're measuring up to the standard He set for us, what are you going to get when you look into it? You're going to get an accurate reflection of your spiritual strength. Lastly, for this second main section, it's important to note uh, this, and I think this is an important point to include in here, and it, it kind of goes along with the other lessons about asking for strength. You know, sometimes Christians, they can start to believe that they are actually uh, weaker than they truly are. For instance, the Christian who asks for help and is willing to admit that they need God's strength, they should understand that by merely asking for strength, having the courage to ask for strength, they have actually already shown that they have a certain level of both courage and strength simply for asking. Some, some are afraid to ask, but that shows strength when you, you know that you need help and that you're, you, you uh, actually ask for help. So with that said, let's now move into the final main section, the third and final main section of this lesson. And in this main section, I just want to close with five uh, things. I want to discuss five things that we can do to help strengthen other Christians. And some of this overlaps with the other lessons. And so first up, to help strengthen other Christians, we must make sure we faithfully attend every church gathering we can. I think that's a great place to start. Just before the Hebrews writer gave the command not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together, in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 24, uh, sometimes I think we overlook this verse, he said, And let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works. And one reason it is sinful to willfully forsake the assembling with our brethren is because it is a failure to give and to receive needed encouragement. We all need that, and that's why God commanded that. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 24, reveals that we have a duty uh, to encourage our brethren by faithfully assembling with them each week. And that's not talking about when you get sick and you, you have to miss for a justified reason, but that is a weekly command to assemble with our brethren. And something I think that's important for us to consider about this topic, about assembling with our brethren, and the command that we have to encourage our brethren is that although it is a command, 
we shouldn't just view it simply or merely as a command. We should view it as an opportunity. That's the way we should look at it. And may we always view assembling with our brethren to study God's word, assembling with them to worship God. May we view that as a blessing, view that as a privilege, and of course, as, as I said, an opportunity. And that's the way King David certainly viewed worship. Uh, if you go back to Psalm chapter 122, verse 1, I know he lived and died under the Old Testament, but David had the right attitude towards worship. He said in that verse, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. And is that our attitude, our mindset towards assembling with our brethren? When Christians forsake the assembling, they're being selfish. That's just, that's just how the Bible would depict that uh, behavior. They're disobeying Philippians chapter 2, verse 4, which says, Look not every man on his own things, but every man on the things of others. And so J Travis made this point, Just as a lump of coal that's removed from a burning fire will quickly go out, a Christian who uh, does this, the same by withdrawing from their brethren and, and not assembling with them, they'll quickly lose uh, their salvation. They'll fall away from the grace of God if they persist in that. And so we got to be careful about that. And as Travis noted, Christianity, it is not a solo religion. You can't do it alone. God didn't intend for it to be done alone. In His Word, God has revealed that we need to be around each other uh, often to help encourage one another to fight the good fight, uh, uh, the good fight of faith uh, together so that we can all go to heaven. Next up and second, to help strengthen other Christians, we can strive to spend time with our brethren outside of Sundays in midweek Bible study gatherings. And I think we all know this very well, that we live in a very busy society, and sadly sometimes that bleeds over into the church and affects us as Christians. And sometimes we can choose to busy ourselves with so many unnecessary things that we neglect the truly needful things. And does that ever happen to you? Sometimes we just get so busy. And I believe in the Lord's church that we would, as a whole, be more spiritually strong if we strove to sacrifice more of our own time, our own personal time, to be with our brethren. I think we'd be stronger. I believe we're lacking in the closeness that many of our first century brethren had with one another. And that goes back to what Travis was noting. As you look uh, in, in the New Testament, you read in the book of Acts and how these Christians, uh, how, how often they were together. They were with each other very often. They'd often be together uh, one, uh, many more times than just once or twice per week. Sometimes they'd be together uh, with each other daily. Acts chapter 5, verse 42, it says, And daily in the temple and in every house they cease not to teach and preach Jesus Christ. And so I think this is a good question for us to ask as it relates to spending extra time with our brethren. When is the last time that you invited a brother or sister or maybe a family within the congregation you're a member at, over to your house to share a meal, maybe to have a Bible study or to visit. When's the last time you opened up your home and had them over? And hopefully it wasn't long ago that you've done that. And so we need to be in each other's houses, in each other's lives. Next up and third, to help strengthen other Christians, we can encourage them to study the prayer life of Jesus. I think that's a powerful one. And not only to study his prayer life and, and uh, how Jesus prayed and learn about it, but also to work on strengthening their own personal prayer life. And, you know, when Jesus needed strength, because he did need strength when he was in his fleshly body, what did he do? He went to his Father in prayer. And we're commanded as Christians to do the same thing. We're to pray without ceasing. 1 Thessalonians 5.17. Philippians chapter 4, verse 6, it says, Be careful for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. And so if you are a Christian who wants to grow in spiritual strength, then God wants you to let your requests be made known to Him. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 7, it says, Casting all your care upon Him. And that word care can actually mean anxiety. Casting all your anxiety upon God. Why? For He careth for you. Next up and fourth, to help strengthen other Christians, we can get busy and serve in spiritual labors with them, with our brethren. 
such as evangelistic efforts. When you're engaged in these spiritual labors with your brethren, it, it's just a byproduct of being with your brethren and laboring is that you're going to be strengthened. In Philippians chapter 2, verse 5, Paul said this. He said, uh, talked about Christ, and he said, "...let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus." And what was the type of mind that Jesus had? Well, I think a good word for that is he had a selfless mind. And he loved to serve others, and he lived that life. And so we must work to develop the same selfless mind that Christ had. When we engage in spiritual service for the Lord with our brethren, it often helps us take our focus off of our personal struggles because we're choosing instead to place our focus on the needs of others. Serving in spiritual labors with our brethren, it will strengthen our relationship with them, and it will also provide us with true satisfaction. Why? Because we can know that we're helping to carry out the mission of Christ together. Next up and lastly, here's the fifth and final item on the list. To help strengthen other Christians, we can be a good listener. You know, that, that point, if you, you just think about that point, being a good listener, it might seem insignificant to us, but it truly is not insignificant. When we are attentive to other people, uh, to our brethren and just to people of the world even, uh, this, this, I could go off into talking about evangelism, but when we're attentive to them, we show them that we care about them. Isn't that right? When we listen and we show them that we're engaged in what they're saying, it shows that we care about them. And one of the ways that we can show other people, our brethren too especially, that we're being attentive is by giving them the, our eye contact uh, when they're speaking with us. Letting them know, I, I hear what you're saying. And if we're good listeners, if we're active listeners, then as Christians, uh, when we hear our brethren, uh, and, or when, when our brethren are hurting, or maybe they're in need of strength, they might indirectly say something to us that gives us a cue that they're in need of our help. Uh, they, they might not come out and ask you for help, but just by listening, you might pick up on they need some of our help, or need my help. And so I think that's a very important uh, thing for us uh, to consider. You know, and, and they also might say something in a certain way that indicates that something is bothering them when they speak. And this, I think, go, relates back to uh, what James uh, said in James chapter 1, verse 19. And in that verse, we know what uh, James said. Uh, he, he said, Wherefore, my beloved brethren? He said, Let every man be swift. To hear. That, that is the idea of being quick, ready to hear, to listen. And then he contrasts that by saying, and be slow to speak and slow to wrath. And so let us be attentive, be good listeners. And so I'll end this lesson uh, by extending the invitation uh, since we're at the end of our, our lessons. If you are here today and have not done so yet, uh, please choose to obey the precious gospel of Jesus Christ. If you don't know how to do that, uh, we'd be glad to study with you. Any, any of the members here, you, you can approach us and we'd be glad to sit down and study with you uh, to further discuss what you, what, what's required of you, what has God said in His Word that you must do to be saved, and to just summarize what the Bible teaches. The Bible teaches that you need to hear the gospel. You need to hear the good news message that Jesus Christ died for your sins. Uh, Romans 10, 17 again says, Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. You need to believe that Jesus is who He said He was. He claimed to be the, uh, the divine Son of God. And He said in John chapter 8, verse uh, 24, that if you don't believe in Me, you don't believe that I am He, uh, or I am, you will die in your sins. Uh, also, Luke 13, 3, Jesus has required all sinners to repent of their sins if they want to go to heaven. And that's not just a one-time thing, that's a lifelong thing. We have to live a life of repentance. Uh, the Bible also teaches that all sinners need to confess their faith in Jesus as being the divine Son of God before others. Romans 10, 9 and 10 teaches that. We have in Acts chapter 8, the Ethiopian eunuch, he made that great confession. He said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And what happened next? Philip, in that chapter, baptized him. The Bible is very clear that baptism is required. It's essential to your salvation. And so if you've not done that, if you've not obeyed the gospel, if you've not been baptized into Christ, uh, the opportunity is available to you today, and you can do that. Uh, or if you're, a, uh, if you're a Christian, if you need prayers, prayers for strength, you can come forward and make it known as we stand and sing our invitation song.